Hi, I'm Dr. Ruby Payne, and what we're going to look at is Chapter 1 of Emotional Poverty Book 1. And we're going to look at the unregulated, unintegrated brain. What does that mean when a student is out of regulation and has an unintegrated brain? Well, if you go in your book to page 10, what you will see is a blank page. And I'm gonna ask you to use that page to lay your hand down and draw around your hand. Now, I know that's kind of awkward and I'm gonna have you do it, but it's to use your hands as a model for your brain. Dr. Siegel, a, a neuropsychologist out of UCLA, he says that your hands are actually a very good model for your brain. And so if you take your hands and put them like this, this is really actually about the size of your brain. And I know that's not real comforting, but the bottom line is your brain has two hemispheres. It's about the size of your hands actually. So bigger people have bigger hands and it's about three pounds. It's the consistency of soft butter. And your, your arm represents your spine, okay? And your spine and your brain stem are connected, and then there's nerves that connect them, and one of them is the vagus nerve. We're only going to look at one side of your brain right now, but I want to show you this hand model for two reasons. One, you can teach it to your students, and number two, it helps understand why a student would explode. So the first part of that we're going to look at is your brain stem. So if you don't mind labeling this brain stem and your brain stem is where you take your first emotional hit. It is where you decide whether something's safe or you belong. And when a person takes an emotional hit, the first thing they have to decide is, am I going to fight? Am I going to run? Am I going to freeze? And of those three things, they freeze first, run second, fight is last. Many people think it's first, it's last. And this controls your involuntary and your motivational systems. So involuntary of breathing, saliva, eye blinking, etc. Motivational systems are like eating, food, sex, sleep, all the motivational systems. And this is where you make your first hit and you decide how am I going to handle this okay and one of the most interesting things is because it's so fast we'll talk about it more in emotional poverty book two but one of the things the FBI says is if you want to know what one of the most important parts of the body to watch if you want to know if you're getting the truth or not is the feet because what happens when you have to decide whether you're going to fight run or freeze and that response is 200 to 5,000 times faster than thought. It goes right down your spine. And one of the first indicators is the feet. Now, just let me say a few things about this. If you've dealt with young children, you know that one of the things they do when they're upset is they fight or they run, okay? And part of the deal is it's automatic. It's so fast. And what Navarro said, the FBI agent, is you watch for the relationship between a distressed behavior and a pacifying behavior. And so one of the pacifying behaviors is right here. Your body is in distress, it's calming itself down, okay? And one of the things we know is that it's an indicator of the stress level of the student. And what happened to the brainstem? The next part of your brain that we want to talk about is your amygdala, which is your thumb. So if you don't mind right now putting on your uh, drawing amygdala, A-M-Y-G-D-A-L-A. And what your amygdala does is it's where your emotional self, it's the part that's largely structured by the time you're three, totally to many ways, structured by the time you're six and then restructured again in adolescence, but it's the emotional center of your brain. And I wanna talk a little bit about how that got built. When you're an infant, you have so many stimuli coming to you at once that you have to sort. One book I read said that you have like 12 trillion stimuli coming at you and you're just sorting constantly. Is it safe? Do I belong? Do I like it? Not. And you're trying to figure that out. If I like it, I'm going to move toward it. I don't, I'm going to move away from it. 
I smell the milk. I like it. I'm going to move toward it. I like the person who holds me. I don't like it. I'm moving away. And that becomes then your basic response. It's where cortisol is released. And cortisol is what makes you afraid, okay? And it is structured before you have vocabulary. So you act on information even though you don't know why. And what we know is if you come out of financial poverty, your amygdala, when you were young, your amygdala is better, bigger and therefore makes you, tends to make you more reactive than if you come out of an educated household. Now surrounding your amygdala is something called the hippocampus, H-I-P-P-O campus, big campus. And it's where you store your, your autobiographical information, your story of who you are, okay? And what we know is if you come out of financial poverty, that hippocampus is smaller than if you come out of an educated household. Now, what happens then is that this then is these fingers now, the back of your hand is called the cortex. And if you don't mind labeling this, the cortex. And what the cortex does is where you go for thoughts, okay? It's ideas, representations, language. And it's the very top of your brain right here. And then these two middle fingers are the prefrontal cortex. They're the regulator of the brain. It's how your brain regulates itself. And the, the fastest way to explain this basically is that little voice you have inside your head. Like if I asked you how many of you have been on the freeway and you thought seriously about helping somebody off the road, you didn't like the way they were driving. Well, you didn't. And one of the reasons you didn't is you said things to yourself like, I don't want to live in jail. I don't look good in orange, whatever. But the bottom line, you are regulating your brain. Here's what happens when your brain is unregulated and unintegrated, okay? When your brain is regulated and integrated, your amygdala talks to your brain stem and it talks to your cortex. There's conversation between the two. When it's unregulated and when it's regulated, these two middle fingers control your response. And when your brain is unregulated and unintegrated, in other words, it's not talking to parts of itself, then you have this an in your face explosion. Now, one of the things that becomes critical on this is that as educators, we've been taught that when a student explodes at us, that's a form of uh, disrespect. And so a lot of times what we do as educators, we go back at a kid like that. Well, when this happens, you have two unregulated, unintegrated brains in the room and it's not pretty. So the question becomes this, when you have this happen and it's an in your face explosion, the first thing we'll have to say to ourselves as educators is, okay, I got an unregulated, unintegrated brain in front of me and what am I gonna do about it? Now, I wanna give you some calming strategies and some regulation strategies that are in the book, but I need to say this first. Two things about this. When a person explodes, how long do you think it takes on average for the blood flow to come back to the cortex, the part of the brain that has language and thinking? It depends who you read, but it's tw at least 20 minutes. So the bottom line is when we try, right after a kid has exploded, to have a conversation, that's pretty much a mistake because the blood flow to the cortex isn't even there. So one of the things you have to do is calm them down. I'm gonna give you a couple strategies for that. But one strategy I wanna give you is for the regulation of the brain. The, the simplest way I know how to explain regulation is this. It's that voice inside your head. When I was an elementary principal, we had this little third grade boy who had ADHD in the worst sort of way. And his mother did not want him to have any meds, so we had to calm him down. So one of the things we did is we said to him, hey, 
do you have this voice inside your head that talks to you all the time and tells you to do things you shouldn't be doing? He goes, yep. We said, what's his name? He said, Jack. We said, does Jack sit right here on your shoulder and talk to you all the time? He said, yes. We said, what kinds of things does he say to you? Well, he tells me I should get up and run around. What should you say to Jack when he says that? Well, I should tell him, you know, I can't. I have to wait to recess. What other kinds of things does Jack say to you? Well, he tells me I should hit Robert in the back of the head. What kinds of things should you say to Robert when, when he tells you that? What kinds of things should you say to Jack when he tells you that about Robert? Well, I can't hit Robert right now. I gotta wait to recess. Let's work on that one. But during the day then, when he was out of control, the teacher would look at him and she'd go, and the little boy would go, and then he was good for a while. But the bottom line, that's regulation. So there's a tool in your book on page 47 that I want to tell you about very quickly. It's called a storybook. And for young children, this is one of the most effective regulation tools I know. A friend of mine, Matt, had a, a campus of 700 four-year-olds. And he had this little four-year-old named Robert. He said he's everything you don't want. Robert would get, run off the, the school grounds. They couldn't find him. He'd hide. He hit people, he spit on people, he threw things, he uh, threw temper tantrums. He would whip out his private parts, sometimes to show them off, sometimes to take care of his business. So using this strategy that's in your book on page 47 called a storybook, within one semester, the only thing the boy was still doing was having a temper tantrum, which I thought was amazing. But what they did was this, took a blank book and Matt, the principal, drew a vertical line down the, the middle of it. Now, I wanna say one thing about young eyes. Four, five, and six-year-olds, their eyes track vertically. In fact, one of the reasons many of them have difficulty reading is because their eyes can't track left to right. So if you're dealing with young children, you wanna do it vertically. On the left-hand side of the sheet is what the child did on the right-hand side of the sheet is what the child was supposed to do. So if you look at that sheet, what you will see is the first thing Matt did was identify Robert. And he just used stick figures like you see. He said, Robert, this is you. Does it look like you? And little boy said, well, I got more hair. So he gave him more hair. Then he identified how he felt. He's angry. Then he identified what he did with his body. He kicked the teacher. You have to be sure that children know what their body is doing. And then the last thing is how the victim felt, because you're building in compassion. On the, left, on the right side of the sheet, then you, you write down what he was supposed to do. Okay? So the first thing he's supposed to do is use words. I'm angry. Okay? The second thing, his feet are supposed to be on the floor. That's what his body is supposed to do. Then how he will feel if he does it correctly, how the teacher will feel if the victim, if you will, will feel if he does it correctly. Then Matt made Robert read that story to him from the pictures until he could tell the story. He sent the book back to the classroom with Robert. If Robert engaged in a behavior that was already in the book, a teacher had a beanbag chair at the back of the room that Robert sat in and read over the book, if it was a new behavior, then they sent him to Matt. Matt put that behavior in the book. And that's how they got that much change in one semester. And the book has many calming strategies in it. They're on page 18. But I just want to give you one that's quick and very quick. And it's called Looking Up. If I asked you right now to bow your head and recall how you felt when, when you graduated from high school. Okay, please do that. Now look at the ceiling. What happened to that thought? It went away. And the reason it did was this. When your eyes are in that up position like that, it's not possible for your brain to access feelings. Neurologically, when your eyes are up like that, and unless the child has had neurological damage, regardless of race or gender, when the eyes are up like this, you can't access feelings. So one of the fastest ways to calm down a kid is to make them look at the ceiling. 
and you can put pictures on the ceiling. I know one a counselor told me, she said, Ruby, we had this first grade boy who was just out of control all year. And we put puppies and dogs and stuff on the ceiling. And now when he gets upset, he goes back there and looks at him and he just calls right down. And the bottom line is you can teach students how to do it. Because when their eyes are up like that, they can't get feelings. When their eyes are down, close to their heart, that's when you have the feelings. So it's a fast, fast way to calm students down. So there's several other strategies in the book for calming them down. But chapter one looks at the unintegrated brain and how you calm students down. Thank you for being with me for this series on chapter one.